The gospel is Jesus righteous. But evangelicals have frequently made the gospel into me righteous, me better, me blessed, me, me, me. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Isaiah 6. In just a moment, we're going to go through that game-changing passage and reveal the next game-changing verse this time born of the realization not of some great success but actually a proper view of the reality of our failure so we're calling this message i'm still sinful and as you find isaiah 6 let me just say that um do you understand that we're evangelicals i wonder sometimes if we really understand all of the history that got us to this place so let me see if i can just buzz through some of this church history quickly originally there was christians in the book of acts and over time the organized church deteriorated through de-emphasis on the word of god into what through centuries not immediately came to be known as the catholic church then there was the great schism in 1054 so that there was the catholic church and the orthodox church uh, various points of divergence there on both sides from the Word of God, but then uh, further uh, separation when around 1500 or so, Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses uh, to the door and the protesters or the Protestants uh, stepped forward and said, hey, this is basic Christianity. This is sola scriptura, which means the Bible alone. Here are uh, the Bible basics. Um, we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that the Bible in its original autographs was free from error, totally infallible, totally inspired by God. And from this perfect Word of God, we get some doctrines that can't be compromised. The substitutionary atonement that Jesus died and paid penalty for our sin so that a holy God could forgive us. Of the virgin birth, which is the idea that Jesus is God. He doesn't have a human father. He has a human mother and a divine father. The second person of the Trinity in the incarnation was God becoming man. Now, these are things that cannot be compromised. And so over time, as Protestants moved away from these things, you get main line uh, denominations who say no to those Bible basics. And then you get basically two groups. You get fundamentalists who say yes to the Bible, but they add an extra biblical code of behavior. And then you get, sometime after the Second World War, you get evangelicals who say yes to the Bible, yes to the gospel, yes to the Bible basics, uh, no to mainline Protestantism, and no to fundamentalism, which believes the Bible but is always angry about it and adds a bunch of stuff that isn't even in the Bible. So you're in an evangelical church by that definition. Now, this is the point. We are in zero danger of falling into the legalism of our fundamentalist forefathers. Over 10, 15, 20 years, I could give you a thousand surveys right now. I could spend the rest of the morning on statistics, but this is beyond dispute. Evangelicals have increasingly drifted through concern over legalism into license. So that every survey indicates now that we are nearly undiscernible from our non-believing neighbors. Same rates of divorce, same rates of addiction, same rates of suing one another, same rates of all these things that do not constitute the biblical call to holiness. The game changer is not a strong message coming about behavior. The game changer is a fresh view of the holiness of God. That's why I had you turn to Isaiah 6, and I want to begin to go through those verses. Let's be reminded about who God is, because I know you're probably thinking to yourself, man, James, I mean, some evangelical churches, but that's why I came to Harvest. I thought we were serious about the Bible. I thought we were serious about holiness. See, the problem comes when we compare ourselves to the other boats in the water. We fail to see how far we've drifted from shore. Now, shore, in the matter of Christian behavior, 
is the character of God himself, his holiness. And we're about to study the standard. So let's look back at Isaiah chapter 6. Our goal here is to get a true benchmark of what Christ rose from the dead to provide for his sincere followers. Begin with this thought. God is infinite holiness. Infinite. Uncountable, unmeasurable, unfathomable, unalterable holiness. Can I say that again? Those are big words, loved ones. God is uncalculable holiness. God is immeasurable holiness. God is unfathomable, unalterable holiness. In the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah reigned 52 years. He was a fixture in the nation of Israel until leprosy took his life. And um, the nation was in great turmoil when Isaiah was called. Now, I've been saying this in every Game Changer message. I've been saying that uh, all Scripture is profitable, but not all Scripture is equally profitable. And if we had a better sense of the just treasure of certain mountain peaks in Scripture, then every time I said to God's people, let's open to the book of Isaiah, we would break into applause. Because Isaiah is really real close to the Mount Everest of the Old Testament. And Isaiah 6 is one of the peaks in this most treasured of ranges. A little backdrop. Isaiah was called to minister to the affluent leaders of his day. He preached the holiness of God during the reign of four different kings. He ministered without compromise in a day of moral decline. From his lips poured forth dignified oratory like the world had never seen before. His Hebrew, the language in which he wrote, His Hebrew is the finest and most eloquent in all of the Old Testament. He is the greatest of the prophets. While Jonah ran and Jeremiah wept and Habakkuk cried how long, Isaiah stood and proclaimed the righteous character of God to a nation that was in a moral freefall. So... I hope that gives us a little bit of a sense of who we're hearing from and where we're finding this game changer. This was the year uh, that he was called, the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died, see the next words there, I saw, what's it say? I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord. Now, I've often pointed out to you that the capitalized L-O-R-D signifies God's covenant name. Could we note here that it's not the capitalized letters? Could we note here instead that we're seeing lowercase O-R-D, which means not I saw Yahweh, not personal, warm, proximitous, not at all. Whether waking or sleeping, in a vision or in a dream, we're not told. But Isaiah was supernaturally transported to the very throne room of the God of the universe. In fact, John chapter 12, verse 41 indicates that he was actually seeing here the pre-incarnate Christ. That is, he gazed upon the creator, the second person of the Trinity. John 1.18 says that no one has seen God the Father at any time including Isaiah 6. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So, um, 
he's seeing not Yahweh, but lowercase o-r-d. What he's saying is, I saw the ruler. I saw the king. I saw number one in all the universe the day the king died. So he's getting in his calling to serve the Lord a vision that we desperately need renewed in our day. Notice how he goes on. His detail will provide by the Holy Spirit more than enough to stir up our souls. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. One translation says, lofty and exalted. The main reason the church has lost its moral vision is because it has lost its lofty and exalted view of God. Embracing the comfort of his nearness, we have lost the compelling force of his transcendence. God is not the man upstairs. God is not an old codger in a white coat. God is ineffable glory, the Bible says, and he dwells in unapproachable light. In fact, the scripture says that no one can see God and live. You can't actually see him and continue to exist. And that's the God that Isaiah saw and how he saw him, notice, seated. Love that. Seated on a throne, of course. Notice, not pacing back and forth, not wringing his hands, not struggling or searching, just there as he is now, seated on a throne, the seated sovereign. And why is he sitting down? Because he can. Why do we stand? We stand to work, we stand to handle, we stand to do business. And if you've been around our church for a while, you know that I'm very fond of saying that God, you probably know what I'm about to say, some of you, that God rules the universe with his feet up. He's not maxed. He could have made 10 more exactly like this one and not been taxed. The totality of us is not in the realm of possibility, even a challenge for him. He's not a little better than us. He's not a little higher than us. He's not a little more than us. He's not a perfected version of us. All of those are lies of the enemy present in the cults of our day and of any day. No, this Lord that he saw, lofty and exalted, seated on a throne. Let's just chase these details down. Notice next he says... The train of his robe, now the train of the robe is the part of the robe that shows honor, uh, seldom seen today except in a formal wedding. The train of the robe is the symbol of grandeur or splendor. And when I first uh, preached this passage many years ago now, I show my age by saying that I showed not a picture of Lady Diana's wedding, but a picture of Queen Elizabeth's wedding. Um, regardless, the principle remains that um, the length of the train is the symbol. You say, that's really quite something. Uh, like uh, her mother-in-law, uh, Diana's robe was stretched all the way down the aisle. Now, we have a lot of uh, lovely married women with us today, as with every week in church and I would be very surprised if there's one of them here who had a, I would think that many of them had a long, beautiful white gown. Ladies, hands up if you had a long, beautiful white gown if you're married. And, and how many had uh, with it a little bit of a trail or a train out behind? But keep your hand up if yours went all the way down out the back of the church and into the parking lot. Hands up if you had that. You say, well, I would never do that. I said, if I did that, someone would say to me, well, who does she think she is, the, the Queen of England? But in this case, we find out that actually the Queen of England does consider this appropriate, and I doubt anyone's complaining after all. Do you see? The length 
of the train is the symbol of the splendor. And what does Isaiah say about the Lord on the throne? The train of his robe, say it, three words, say it. Come on, say it together. The train of his robe. It filled the temple back and forth, back and forth, doubling and redoubling until the train, the symbol of his splendor, filled the temple. So awesome is this view of God that Isaiah can look no higher than the hem of his garment. And if the hem of his garment fills the temple, think of the splendor of his personhood that that only represents. Almost as though he can't even take that in. You know, when you see something, and it's like, I don't even know what to say about that. So he looks around, and he's like, let me tell you about the angels, verse 2. Above him stood uh, seraphim, angels, notice, standing to serve the seated sovereign. The Hebrew here, uh, seraph, means literally burning ones, a countless burning throng. And notice the description of the wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two, six wings, and with two he flew. Now, it's interesting that four wings for relating to God, two wings for serving God. Just think about that for a minute. Four for relating to him, only two for serving him. But how many exhausted here right now from five for serving him, one for relating to him, or less? Two cover my face lest I see him and be consumed in a moment. Two cover my feet, lest he see me. Then only two left to serve him as well as I might. All of the verbs here, covered, covered, flew, are continuous action. Their motion is ceaseless as they fulfill the bidding of Almighty God. Notice in verse 3, one called out to another. Picture two lines, one on either side of God's throne. One line calling out to the other. The other line calling out back to the first in the presence of holy God, an antiphonal chorus that never ceases. And what are they calling out? Think of all of the things that evangelicalism in this new millennium would put on the lips of the seraph serving the seated sovereign. Most would suggest that they should be saying, Loving, loving, loving is our God. Some would suggest that the angels should be saying, tell me, patient, merciful, full of grace. And all of these things are true. But none of them so foundational as what they actually say. If you want to know the God of the universe, start with this. Holy. And understand this definition. Holy means separate. Look up here. But not separate like distance. Not separate like far off. Not at all. Separate like other. Theologians call this holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, completely distinct, not in any significant regard 
like us. And these two words, first transcendence, then imminence. Evangelicalism has so emphasized imminence, close, near, loving, gracious, warm, kind, compassionate. Come on, and everyone say, and all of it's true. All of it is true, but a truth in isolation is an untruth. And when we teach the part without the whole, we distort the part. And loving and gracious and patient and kind taught without, this is imminence, his closeness, his nearness, but taught without the recurring refrain of his transcendence deifies man humanizes God so that at the end what we're left with is someone nearly impotent and entirely unable to help us with the basic things that are in reality nothing to him. Again and again and again the scripture says is anything too hard for the Lord? And if you don't immediately call to mind the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe fills the temple, the seraphim burning throng crying out, transcendent, transcendent, not like us. If you're so caught up in his nearness and his closeness that you've lost the vision of the God on the throne, then he's barely worthy of my weak prayers and hardly compelling enough to give my life to, really just a convenience and opportunity to upgrade my personal plan for earthbound satisfaction while I can get it. Strongholds are stubborn. They hold us back from embracing God's love. They hold us back from applying God's word. They tie us back, they suffocate us, they restrain us again and again. But one verse of scripture, just one verse, at the right time, with the power of the Holy Spirit, can change it all. And James McDonald is bringing you not just one, but seven scriptures that can change everything. Seven scriptures that shatter strongholds. Take the things that have held me and obliterate them. Just think of it, the weight that must come down on these things that have held me, but these are heavy scriptures and they will shatter the strongholds. With your gift to walk in the word, you'll be able to destroy strongholds through the scriptures brought to you in the Game Changer Playbook. Study and reflect on how God changed everything for people of the Bible by giving them words they needed to hear and words that are still life-changing today. Display those verses with seven tear-out scripture art prints to remind you of God's promises. And with your support of $125 or more, we'll also send you the exclusive Game Changers MVP box. Open it to find the complete seven DVD series of Game Changers featuring bonus chats with James McDonald and family only available on this DVD set. Gear up with a Walk in the Word coach's hat created exclusively for our MVPs. Included are bonus items that equip you and remind you of the importance of removing strongholds from your life. Are you ready? Your strongholds don't stand a chance against God's Word. Call 800-545-6800 or go now to jamesmcdonald.tv to receive these game-changing resources and decide today that it's time to shatter your strongholds with the power of God's Word. Again, verse 3, one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Note the repetition expresses the force. It's an idiom of the Hebrew language that repetition shows force. We don't have this in English. In Hebrew, someone would say, I fell into a pit. And they go, oh, well, that probably was okay. But if someone said, I fell into a pit pit, then they would be indicating that they had encountered something that was problematic. 
If someone said, this, we just don't have this in English, but in Hebrew, if they said, I fell into a pit, 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 you would be surprised that they were out and need immediately to understand how such an awful occurrence had somehow been resolved. And with that understanding as your backdrop, can I point out to you that it doesn't say here God is holy, not holy, not holy, holy, but holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Kadesh, the superlative form of the Hebrew language, repeated three times, could hardly be more strongly stated. Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O God, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? And then the refrain, the whole earth is full of his glory, meaning there is no place on the earth, no square inch in the universe that your eyes could fall about which this God could not declare, that is mine, I made it. And from that reality comes then the echoing evidence of his presence. Everything from the atom to the size of the universe, everything from the human eye to the most beautiful creature you could see on the National Geographic channel, all of it shouting the beautiful design, exclaiming, there's a God. There's a God who made all of this and fit it together in such beauty and choreography. As Isaiah saw this scene, the Lord on the throne, his robe, the burning seraphs, as he heard the heavenly chorus singing antiphonally, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And as the foundations of the thresholds, notice, shook at the voice of him who called out, the house was filled with smoke. How awesome. To quickly veil Isaiah's vision lest he be consumed in another moment by the unspeakable, unsearchable, unalterable holiness of God. His moral worthiness. His utter terror. Now that, loved ones, is a vision of God that we have lost in the evangelical church. Our view of the highness and Holiness of God is frequently intoned by romantic worship choruses that sound more like something you'd sing to your boyfriend than something that you would say to the transcendent God of the universe. And while the intimacy is real and genuine and personal and experienced, it must also have with it the terror-producing awareness of his transcendence that gives to me the sense, though he loves me dearly and forgives me completely, I cannot just act any way I want. Leading to this game-changer, so serious and so seldom seen, Verse 5, and I said, if you find yourself hearing this teaching and saying to yourself, how am I to respond to this? We have our example. Game changer, Isaiah 6, 5. And I said, Woe is me. So get in the scene. Isaiah is being called. God is giving him a vision of his transcendence. Whether transported there or supernaturally allowed to see it, there's no televangelist gimmick here. This is happening. He's seeing what none of us have seen. And now he's responding 
to the reality that exists this moment and we will all someday see. And his first response is, Woe is me. The word woe means that calamity has fallen or is about to fall. Who can stand before this God? Who can stand in his presence? I am a man of unclean lips, he says. The things that have come out of my mouth, the things that I haven't said, I don't have to go to my hands and my feet, I don't have to go to my mind and my memory of my actions. I'm destroyed by the thought of my words in the presence of holiness. Now this is the always response of real encounter with God. It's as predictable as the sunrise. Do you remember Abraham walking with the Lord in a discussion about what should happen to Sodom? And do you remember as the dialogue began, he said this sentence, I am but dust and ashes. Peter has the Lord revealed in Luke chapter 5 in the miraculous catch of fish, and he says, Depart from me, O Lord, I am a sinful man. John in Revelation chapter 1 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I fell at his feet as though dead. And Isaiah says, Woe is me! All real contact with God produces a sense of unworthiness. That's the standard. That's where the bar is set. That's the thing I'm supposed to be pursuing. Woe is me! And that's the game changer. And here's the sentence summary. I am a sinful person. Yes, I am gospel graced. Yes, I am fantastic forgiven. Everyone say yes but I remain in my human condition and I am sinful. I am not yet holy. I am not yet righteous. And the condition of taking the gospel of grace and converting it into an I am awesome, that is what the Bible calls self-righteousness. And that's why it's a game changer to have this in your theology. It changes first how you see yourself. I am so blessed. I am so graced. God has been so merciful with me. I'm not better than my neighbor. Why do I know Jesus? I'm not better than the people I work with. I'm not better than the people marching in the protest parade. I'm not better than the people that are doing this or that. I'm not better than anyone. I'm saved. When the lifeguard pulls the drowning person by the back of their neck out of the water that would have finished them, they don't get out and say, I am awesome. They say, thank you for saving me. But it is amazing how evangelicalism as a whole and us, come on, say that's us, how we have in, as individuals have become through the decades harsher, more judgmental, 
more harder on each other, harder on everyone else, more insistent and demanding that people stop their nonsense so my life can be better, more selfish, and here it is. God forgive us. More self-righteous. More self-righteous. The gospel is Jesus righteous. But evangelicals have frequently made the gospel into me righteous, me better, me blessed, me, me, me. So I hope this helps. Make a note of it, please. You might be self-righteous if you have a false standard for measuring righteousness. Things not explicitly stated in the Bible that you've decided are important. Things that God the Holy Spirit did not see fit to inspire a writer to write down, but you act as though somehow you have the fuller edition and you bring with equal weight your points of preference on behavior, and you judge and assess others who don't conform. I love you enough to tell you that that's self-righteousness. Not just that I'm a sinful person in my forgiven state, but that as a sinful person, I tend to view myself as better than others. And if I allow that, we all have that bent. Who can confess to a bent to try to sort of manufacture the details of events so that I'll see myself as better than others? Come on, who can acknowledge that bent? I see myself struggling with that. I see how that's hard for me not to do that. And some are like, no, I won't raise my hand for that because you work so hard at appearing humble and your humility, you're so, so gratified by what you've accomplished in that category, which might not be just quite as awesome as you think it is. It might, in fact, be the backside of the very thing that we're talking about. So I know that I might be self-righteous if I have a false standard how she dresses, how she does her hair, what he drives, where they live, how they raise their children, how they entertain themselves. He still smokes? Are you kidding me? Sometimes I'm coming into church and I see someone outside putting out a cigarette. I mean, hi, Pastor James. And I was like, oh, I just love pastoring this church. I just love that he didn't feel... I grew up in a church where that would have to be covered fast when the preacher was coming, right? God forgive us for that. That's not Jesus' heart. Number one thing Jesus got pounded for, the Bible thumpers in the Gospels pounded Jesus because he was constantly in proximity to people who needed to be pulled out of the pool and never hanging around with people who were Save myself, save myself. Second thing, you might be self-righteous if, in fact, let me just change this list. I might be. Can we just get on the I? I want to be in this with you, and I surely am. I might be self-righteous if, if grace is a one-way street. It's a one-way street. Nothing worse than getting caught in a downtown that has all one-way streets, right, everybody? Man, you can't get anywhere when everything's a one-way street. I can't get back to where I was. And some people, for them, grace is a one-way street. I need it, I need it, I want it, I want it, but they don't, what? They don't give it. They don't give it to their kids, they don't give it to their spouse, they don't give it to anyone, it seems. If you struggle with grace as a one-way street, that's you might be self-righteous, I might be self-righteous, and we might be self-righteous if we have I'm better than X. 
I'm better than those addicts. Are you? You have one of the safer addictions? Just eight cups of coffee a day, that's all I need, those addicts. Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of anything. And while some things might not land you in rehab, if you have to have anything other than the Lord, separate message. I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than new Christians. I'm not better than baby Christians. I'm not better than lost people. I'm not better than the alcoholics. I'm not better than the gays. I'm not better than the guy who's stealing stuff at the office. I might be better at covering it. I might only have Christian sins. But when I see the holy standard that we're all going to appear before, my sense of self-righteousness should be immediately vaporized. Just this. I might be self-righteous if I'm always on the move. Always on the move. I need a new place to work because candidly pastoring this church has brought me to the awareness of the sinfulness of all of you. And if I stay here any longer, I'm gonna have to begin to think that maybe I'm part of the problem. So sorry, this will be my last weekend. I need to go find a new church and, and so that I can pretend again. And I need a new job and I need a new neighborhood and I need new friends and I need new everything because I have to keep hitting reboot because when I stay too long in one situation, I come face to face with my own reality, and I don't want my own reality. I want my, I'm better than other people, so I gotta start over so I can keep the charade going. Now that doesn't mean taking a promotion or moving close to your family. I'm not, you know I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about our tendency to put it all on others and vacate so I can protect my sense of self-righteousness. And finally this. If when I see myself failing, my instinctual response is still to cover and not to confess. What am I covering Proverbs says that he who covers his sin will not prosper. What am I covering? What am I careful to make sure no one finds out about? What texts am I deleting? What history am I eliminating? What behavior am I covering? What places am I going? What things am I doing that I'm managing my sin instead of confessing it. So just this. Man, Isaiah was really laid out there. He was really taken apart. Why, Isaiah? End of verse 5. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And what's so awesome is God walking with Abraham patiently heard his pleas. Though dust and ashes, he patiently heard his pleas for the wicked people of Sodom and showed mercy. And Jesus, though Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, Jesus reached out and called him to be one of his followers. And even though John fell at his feet as though dead, Revelation 1.10. It says, but he laid his hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. Always the same. His holiness, my sinfulness, now his grace. Look at it here in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. 
Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for here a thousand years before the cross. Now, can we all agree that the seraph didn't do this on its own? Can we all agree that the angel wasn't like, I'm going to think I'm going to go get one of those coals. I think God will really like that. Can we all agree that these angels probably only do exactly, come on, everyone say exactly, exactly what God tells them to do. So the text doesn't contain the command we, because the idea of it happening without a command is ludicrous. It's implied. The angel does the Lord's bidding. The holy God looks upon the sinfully aware and then, not to the self-righteous, to the sinfully aware, then he says, go get a coal from the altar. And it's brought. And these sinful lips are, are purged of the sin. And he's declared, paid for, not lightly dismissed, atone, paid for, covered, forgiven. As evangelicals, we would do a better job rejoicing in the gospel if we followed the faithful path of see the Lord, recognize his holiness, see my sin, recognize my unworthiness, receive his grace gratefully, and live not as a self-righteous person, but as a gratefully forgiven person wanting others to experience the same. That's the game changer. And if we stay right there, it makes our testimony so powerful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this um, opportunity to be with these dearly loved ones. And thank you for your word and how it brings us so quickly to reality. Forgive our judgment. Forgive our self-righteousness. Forgive our preference for your nearness and our disdain for the less comfortable. We embrace your holiness and we receive its message of our continuously fallen nature and it makes us more grateful for grace. Seal that reality to our hearts in a way that the enemy cannot snatch it away. And let us be changed by it. And let your church be changed by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In God's heart, righteous things desired by me for right reasons are credited to me as accomplishments. Game changer.